Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final uh, Mark's Alumni Career Chat of the fall 2021 semester. My name is Samantha Bruno. I'm the Career Services Coordinator here, um, and I'm joined with my coworker, Suzanne Grossman, who is the Deputy Director of Alumni Relations and Career Services. Um, and today we are joined by Maria Aretinas. She is an MPA graduate. Um, she is currently at Foley Hogue LLP and previously from Simmons University and has a wonderful career history in diversity, equity, and inclusion, also known as DEI. So Maria, please go ahead and kick us off and tell us a little about, bit about your journey to your current position and if you can reflect on the MPA program as a whole. Sure. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Suzanne. And thank you everyone for joining. It's so nice to meet you all. Um, so I'll just start by saying my career journey has been a complete surprise. I never thought I would work in my current role. I never thought I would be in this line of work, but here I am. And what led me here to DEI at Simmons, to DEI at Foley Hoag in my current role, is this broader commitment I've always had. Um, I've always been very committed to trying to make the world a more just place. And that's looked different uh, throughout my career. So I've worked in the nonprofit sectors primarily. I've, looked, I've worked in higher education sector. And now I'm in the legal industry. Um, but this thread and this, this broader commitment is always what's guided my career decisions that I've made. Um, so, you know, if you actually look at my resume or if you looked at my LinkedIn, you'll see it's all over the place. Um, and, but that's the thread that connects all the experiences. But I would say there have been three transformative moments in my career in particular. Um, so first in 2010, I got a Fulbright grant and I moved to Cyprus. And that was life changing. You know, I worked at the Mediterranean Institute of Gender Studies, volunteered at a domestic violence shelter. I worked at a migrant community center. Um, and, you know, I made lifelong connections I still have to this day. Um, and going to Cyprus changed the trajectory of my life, period. And 100% my career as well. I've since returned multiple times for various work opportunities. Um, and then in 2017, I was invited uh, by a former supervisor to run and manage educational programs for displaced communities and refugee camps in the East Mediterranean. Um, at the time, I was working at the Institute of International Education on programs that connected displaced Syrian students in particular to higher education opportunities. Um, so this invitation, this new opportunity was aligned with what I'd been interested in personally and professionally, but it was doing the work in a very different capacity and I learned a lot from that experience. Um, and then that led me to National Urban Fellows and ultimately to Baruch. So from 2018 to 2019, very recently, um, I was a National Urban Fellow and that brought me to Baruch, that brought me to completing my Master's of Public Administration. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with National Urban Fellows, but I'm a huge fan and I'm a huge advocate of this program. So it's a public sector leadership development program. It's for people of color and for women. And it culminates with a master's degree. It used to culminate with an MPA. Um, it's now based at Georgetown University, but for many years it was at CUNY. And I was part of the last class, I'm proud to say, to graduate at CUNY. Um, I'm, I'm a CUNY girl at heart. I went to Hunter for undergrad as well. So CUNY um, is an important place for me. Um, so the goal ultimately in National Urban Fellows is really just to increase the representation of underrepresented groups in the public sector. But obviously many of us have taken the skills we learned from this program and applied it to the private sector as well, myself included. Um, but you know, I will say because of this program I applied for and I was appointed to my community board, community board 12 in Brooklyn. So, you know, even though my paid work is in the private sector, I still have a very strong commitment to public and civic engagement and National Urban Fellows prepared me for that. Um, and I'm not sure if all of you are already in graduate programs or if perhaps some of you are undergrad as well, but you know, if you have any questions about National Urban Fellows at any point, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, so the way National Urban Fellows is structured is it's 14 months. The 14 months are bookended by two summer semesters at Baruch with in-person classes. And then the nine months in between, we were placed with a mentor where we work full time. Um, and as I mentioned, the fellowship concluded with an MPA. So I got placed at Simmons University for the mentorship portion of the fellowship. And I worked in the Office of Organizational Culture, Inclusion and Equity with Dr. Deborah Joy Perez. And this experience was life-changing. Um, 
you know, as I shared with you, some of the key pivotal moments of my career, I'd worked in supporting displaced communities, I'd worked in higher education, I, I've taught gender and sexuality studies, but I never worked in a DEI office. Um, so this was the first professional experience for me that pivoted me in a slightly different direction. Um, so um, it brought me to the world of DEI, essentially. And what I found in that placement experience is I really enjoyed this practice of operationalizing DEI, meaning like asking, how do you embed a commitment to justice that you have personally or professionally to the institutions and to the systems that you live in and operate under? Or how do you work to hold these institutions and the leadership in these institutions accountable? And for me, those are interesting questions and those are important questions. And I enjoy personally and professionally just the practice of trying to answer them through my work. Um, and that's really what my job is. And that's what I see the responsibility of DEI work being. Um, so following the completion of National Urban Fellows Fellowship and following my MPA degree completion, I applied for a director of DEI programming role at Simmons and I got it. So I was hired. I worked there for about two years in total. And that led me to my current work at Foley Hoag. And now I'm the manager of DEI culture and learning at, at uh, Foley Hoag, mid-sized law firm, headquartered in Boston, also with offices in New York, where I'm based, Paris, and DC. Great, thank you so much. That was a wonderful like uh, summary to hear and everything like that. So going off, you know, perfect segue. Um, how, or what was your transition like of doing DEI going from higher education to the private sector? Yes, so how did it happen? I'm very frank, I got contacted by a recruiter on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm being transparent with all of you. You know, that's how it happened. I wasn't thinking I was gonna apply. Um, I had just been furloughed, to be totally honest, and brought back to my job, as Suzanne knows. So I was not expecting to transition and pivot in this way, but I got contacted. Oh, I'm sorry, Smith, are you, did you have something you wanted to say? No, no, I'm, I'm saying like, oh, I'm so, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, LinkedIn recruiting works, like absolutely. Oh yeah, it's real. And that's another piece of advice, not that any of you are asking for it, but LinkedIn I never really quite fully understood the importance of LinkedIn and its potential role it could play in getting me a job. Um, but this experience demonstrated to me how important it was to have an updated, robust LinkedIn presence, which I'm still working on. Um, but yeah, I got contacted by a recruiter. Uh, they were interested in learning more about my background. They thought I could be a good fit. As I mentioned, I wasn't looking for a job at the time. Um, you know, the thing with DEI though, and the thing with the skill sets you learn from DEI is that the work is very transferable and the skill sets are very transferable. You know, it was, I'm not gonna lie, it was a steep learning curve for me to enter the legal industry from higher education because there are industry specific factors you need to consider and things you need to learn. But once you have a broad sense of how to weave DEI into the workplace, you can really apply those practices anywhere. Um, the transition wasn't as hard as you might think it would be. And also, as I mentioned before, I do have a strong commitment to you know, public engagement, civic engagement, and I'm able to find ways to incorporate that into my life still outside of my paid work. That's important to me. Absolutely, absolutely. yeah. I like how you, like, you emphasize that DEI, it, because DEI is beyond the type of like firms or any organizations you go with. It's not just held to private, public, you know, it is a transferable skill set. Um, so, you know, as you know, DEI work is very broad and has many, many different definitions. So how do you define your own work in DEI versus maybe the places that you've worked? So in that sense, um, you know, I imagine Simmons University and Foley Hoag, they have their own mission to DEI. And so like, how does that align with yours or how doesn't it align with yours? Yeah. So, you know, I think, I think there are a lot of ways to try to make a positive mark on the world. And as I mentioned, that's what's, that's what guides me. Um, but for me, striving to make a workplace more equitable is one way to do it. Um, so to me, DEI work, what it is, is it's, it's about addressing historical imbalances that show up in the workplace. Um, it's about addressing the structural discrimination that creates those imbalances. And then, you know, how does that happen? So it happens by changing, creating policies. It happens by having difficult conversations with leadership. 
It happens by analyzing data and presenting facts that lay out the way bias can show up in the workplace and hiring and promotions and retention and attrition. Um, and then it happens through creating interventions for those issues and the gaps that you do find in the form of mentorship programs, in the form of affinity groups, by changing hiring practices, you know, by changing how you conduct performance evaluations. It happens by looking at your benefits policies, your wellness programs. Um, there are a lot of ways to, in, to potentially intervene in, in the DEI space. Um, I'm very grateful to say that where I work now, Fully HOAG, was actually founded on a commitment to social justice. And I'm very proud of some of the litigation we've been a part of and that we continue to be a part of. So um, Fully HOAG was responsible for Boston school desegregation. They successfully represented the plaintiffs. Um, in the case uh, back in the day that led to Boston school desegregation. Um, right now, Foley Hoag is, is partnering with the American Civil Liberties Union of Louisiana. Um, they are suing the state of Louisiana for racist policing practices. Um, there's a long list of really impressive pro bono work in the realm of racial justice, in the realm of LGBTQ advocacy, in the realm of, you know, um, ending domestic violence that my firm has been a part of that is very meaningful to me and that is very much aligned with my own values. So for me, you know, part of my work, the work of the department I'm in is to make sure that all of these external commitments to justice are reflected internally in how our policies operate and how our practices are. Um, and I'm grateful to say that because I don't know if I would want to or I would have pursued an opportunity if it was if if the values of the organization weren't somewhat aligned with my own. And I see an alignment here in my current role, which I'm very proud of. That's wonderful. Yes. No, thanks for sharing that. Um, I know like what Suzanne and I had mentioned earlier or that that you know we have the Mark School has a DEI committee and um, the conversations have been very productive and progressive on that end. So, but it is interesting to see like how you know when you talk to you know different people about what they see in DEI, sometimes it's not always the same, but they are always correct. So it's how do you mesh all those um, those interests uh, together and. and um, and whatnot. So um, this is the time where you know, I'll keep asking questions, but if anyone has any questions for Maria, please feel free to unmute. I'll definitely give you some time if you want to type it in the chat box um, to, do, to do it there as well. So I'm just going to scan the room and, and please feel free to use the raise hand function or just feel free to unmute too as well. Oh, John, go ahead. Uh, good morning, everyone. How are you? Uh, John Georges, um, actually MSCD graduate from 2019. Um, I'm, I was originally from New York City, born and raised, and now I'm living in Dallas, Texas. So yeah, <laughs> thanks, Baruch. Thanks for that degree. Um, so um, as I came into this role, I became the director of a records office, but then they brought me on board to work as a co-diversity officer because um, it's the first time they created a diversity council and all that because, um, you know, South is a totally different environment from yeah. the Northeast, yeah. as we all kind of have seen or have already known and studied. Um, but one of the challenges that we're facing here is because um, SMU, where I'm working now, is a predominantly white institution and a totally different culture down here as well. So I was wondering if you can kind of speak to how you made the transition of adapting to a different culture, organizational and sometimes even uh, environmental culture and how that helps you with your work. How, like what steps did you take in your own, mm -hmm. from your own perspective to help you acclimate yourself and to help institute changes um, that you felt are, you know, we all know mm -hmm. nothing happens overnight, but yeah. at least the stepping stone or a starting block for, for making some sort of changes that you're uh, within your environment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. and. Um, you know, I can even relate to what you're saying, moving from New York to Boston, even though it's in the Northeast, some of the cultural norms around workplaces are also very different in Boston than they are in New York as well, um, around yeah. DEI work in particular. So I can relate to what you're saying and um, I'll share some thoughts. So first and foremost, um, and uh, you know, obviously how you approach a situation depends on your role, your positioning and the politics of your organization, but I can speak from my own experience and how I've approached it. So um, 
you know, having one on one conversations with as many people as possible to get a lay of the land and get a sense of where people are at, you know, personally, because I think actually relationship building is integral in DEI work and having relationships, having people look to you as someone they can trust will make your job easier down the line. So always, I always start off from a relational perspective and how do I get to know the people I'm working with and how do I get to know the people who are the decision makers at my organization? So I always start there. Um, and you know, I'm not just strategic about it. I also personally like getting to know people and, and that's, a, that's a part of my work that I love. So for me, it also comes a bit naturally to kind of lean into that initially. So that's where I start. And then I usually try to take it upon myself to to do an assessment uh, or to look at the data if, if assessments haven't been conducted or have already been conducted. So when I started at Fully HOAG, I noticed, you know, our, our policies and procedures hadn't been reviewed in a, or updated in a very long time. So I took it upon myself on a quiet day. I said, I'm going to go through all of these policies and procedures and I'm going to see what's happening here. And I noticed, for example, a huge disparity in our parental leave policy. Um, I saw that parental leave for legal personnel was at 18 weeks full-time pay, but parental leave for business services professionals such as myself, anyone who wasn't an attorney at our firm was only two weeks full-time pay. And I said, hmm, I wonder if people know about this. Um, and I raised it with you know, my team. No one had been aware of that discrepancy and late started laying, you know, planting seeds um, and laying the, the, the foundation and the, uh, the groundwork to eventually change that policy. So, you know, I, I kind of did an assessment of policies. I'm proud to say the policy has been changed and now business services professionals and legal personnel both have 18 weeks paid full time off. But that's an aside. Um, I got there because I was just curious to explore and assess our policies and procedures when I first arrived. And in doing, for my own learning purposes, I discovered this massive glaring disparity, um, which informed you know, some actions I took moving forward after that. Another, another gap I identified when I first arrived was that there was no engagement survey. There was no data for us to really look at and rely on. And so I initiated our first firm-wide engagement survey, which is now going to, um, being disseminated on an annual basis. Um, and we collected very detailed demographic data as part of that, um, that survey itself. And what I found was for those who are resistant, and I don't know, John, if this speaks to some of what you're encountering, but when you deal with, with people who are resistant to change or transformation or DEI, generally speaking, Data, I found, is usually a very useful tool to rely on to change minds. Um, so an engagement survey, I don't know if your company has one. Um, ours, you know, as I said, didn't. So we, we, we collected that detailed demographic data. And what we found was what we assumed we would find, which is that there were glaring gaps in engagement between different demographic groups at our firm and in different levels at our firm. And that provided the push our department really needed um, to make some and to justify some of the interventions we were recommending. Um, so I would say relationship building, data collection, and you know, broader assessment of policies and practices are some initial steps that I've taken that have proven very fruitful. Thank you. That was really helpful. Um, and you know, again, it's it's just one of those things where I feel like, you know, the pandemic has really blown open a lot of the discrepancies and the, um, I guess, inequities that are that exist and it's been brought to the limelight. And there's some people who kind of like things status quo and then others who want to see change, but they're also concerned about how it may threaten or jeopardize their roles or their, their comfort zones also. And uh, you know, that's kind of one of the challenges, the uphill battles that we're, we're facing on a daily basis, especially when it's an institution that's deeply embedded in the culture and the community of, of Dallas and Texas itself. Yeah, and I mean, the reality is the, the, the way things have been operating have benefited certain people and allow them to remain in power. Um, so, you know, I, you know, I, I'll, I, it's common to encounter that resistance or that fear from people. And I think it's about you know, you have to approach it differently depending on the, the, the factors shaping the particular person or team's perspective, right? So, 
you know, maybe you need to demonstrate the business case for supporting DEI. I don't know if that would be a, a useful approach for the challenges it sounds like you might be encountering, but that's something I've had to rely on as well. It's like, well, what's the business case for DEI? If people, if we can't win hearts over and, you know, in helping them understand why this is the right thing to do, if the engagement survey data showing how certain demographic groups are struggling more than others in their engagement, well, maybe business will speak to them. Maybe if we, you know, I've, I've provided so much research on the business incentives and the business case for supporting DEI and how having more diverse teams leads to greater uh, productivity, et cetera, et cetera. You can also potentially go that route um, for, for some of the challenges it sounds like you might be experiencing. And sometimes that works too. Yeah, we're definitely trying that in the not never ending battle. But okay. thank you. Appreciate yeah, feel, it. feel free to reach out to after if you want. I'd be happy to talk more. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, Storm, go ahead. All righty. Hi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So my question is basically, um, what are some of the techniques you use to handle employees' own cognitive dissonance in regards to D DEI initiatives that you spearheaded? Because I find that sometimes people might not be vocal if they think that their views are not accepted or if they have challenging views, or um, especially when it comes to such sensitive issues. So I was just wondering how you go about that if they're not vocal? Yeah, great question. And Storm, I will share, we do not have that problem where I currently work. So um, people feel very comfortable expressing their views. I mean, I'm sure there's some people who don't, um, but generally I would say the struggle is, and the priority for our team is really empowering people who are, are uh, traditionally underrepresented in the legal industry to express their views. So. Um, you know, I'm a Foley Hoag is a majority white uh, firm, um, and it's also a majority, you know, older male um, firm. So uh, the majority opinions tend to be the opinions that are more commonly reflected in our in our presentations, in our conversations, in our trainings. Um, so the challenge is less on establishing comfort for those groups and more establishing comfort and, and safety for uh, our communities who are underrepresented at our firm. And that's been my personal priority and focus and how I orient my thinking around the trainings that I conduct. Thank you. Yeah. Great, okay. Uh, we'll go to Vicki and then Lorenzo. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to share important information and resources to us. Um, a question that I have is in regards to when you have a vast background um, and, and you're wanting to kind of hone it in where if you didn't previously possess or have a position where you were titled as a DEI, like how do you kind of bring it, merge everything together so that the package is yes. that you're open to that they're open to you coming in in that title. Yes, Vicki, that's a great question. Um, so I will say on my team, it's only myself and the director who have DEI and prior professional experiences explicitly named in their title. So it's very common, actually, especially now because it's a newer uh, industry, I would say that organizations are taking more seriously. Obviously, people have had commitments to this work for a very long time, but it's only until recently that we're seeing a greater investment um, in the form of creating roles at organizations. So um, it's common for a lot of these departments and teams to be hiring people who don't have a, who, an explicit DEI mentioned in their prior roles, right? So I think it's about creating a narrative for yourself, a DEI narrative for yourself, kind of hopefully like what I did, you know, I don't have a background in DEI for my entire career, that's only recent, but I have a thread and a commitment to social justice that has been present throughout my career and is demonstrated by all of my experiences. And that's what I say, and that's what I rely on to communicate about what led me here to DEI. Um, so I think it's about, for you personally, Vicki, you know, what is it about DEI that interests you? 
have you had, do you have a broader interest in and commitment to, to justice and equity? Um, do you have, have experience working in nonprofits and maybe the mission of the nonprofits is aligned with that commitment to justice? So what, what has led you throughout your career to this point, having some sort of narrative around that and, and somehow, somehow explaining how that connects to the role in question that you're potentially applying to and to DEI work in general, because I think it's easy to, to, to demonstrate that even if it's through volunteer experiences, or maybe you volunteered at your organization's DEI committee, or maybe you're a member of a fin an affinity group, um, whatever it might be, you know, what's your story? What brought you to your interest in, uh, in applying to DEI work? So I'm happy to chat with you more if you want to talk that through some, but like I said, we, we've hired a lot of people who don't have DEI experiences, but they've all had a DEI narrative that explained why this work mattered to them and how the skill sets we were seeking for the particular role with, were aligned with their prior skill sets, which sometimes it's just project management, coordination, you know, transferable skills that you can do in plenty of other roles. Hey, Lorenzo, go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, thank you for that answer from before, because my questions actually are around that, too. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, what are some common like interview questions that you've gotten and answers that are surround DEI? Because I've, I've been in a few interviews recently, and they, they've thrown some questions here. They're like, what type mm -hmm. of books? have you read, like what has shaped your uh, perspective on racial inequality? Mm -hmm. So it just, uh, in your experience, what have you observed and seen? Yeah, yeah those are great questions. Um, I, I haven't been asked those questions in particular, but what I have, um, I have been asked in prior interviews is, or what we ask in our interviews is about examples of DEI initiatives that they the, the candidate has led. Um, and you know how they measured success or effectiveness with with that initiative. Um, so you know um, I'm not going to share I'm not going to share the answers I've provided, but I think generally just you know the the questions that we tend to see that we tend to give are um, around examples of executed DEI projects that were successful and how you measured their success because that's a big question in the DEI world is how do you measure the success. What DEI metrics are you establishing? Um, you know, depending on the role, we're not necessarily going to ask that of everyone, but we may ask it for some people. Um, and then, of course, a very common question to encounter is, you know, what led you to DEI? What led you to this role? Why are you interested in DEI? And as I mentioned with Vicky, having some sort of DEI narrative ready for those interviews, I think, is very important. Um, and I already shared mine, so. Um, I would say those are the two common questions that come to mind that we, we often uh, ask in our interviews. Thank you. And I, I guess my next question is around like, how do you develop more of that narrative? Like, what are some resources you suggest outside of like, like you suggest like community work and affinity groups? So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, I don't know. Lorenzo, you know, where you work um, or if you're employed right now or, but wherever you land um, or wherever you are at the moment, I would say find a way to get involved with, you know, either your company's DEI committee. Most, most companies have a DEI committee. Most companies will have employee resource groups, ERGs or affinity groups you can join. So thinking about taking on a leadership role within those organizations at our firm, you know, we've had, when I started, we had a handful of affinity groups and now we have about 10. Um, so those are all employee led. So employees came to us and said, we wanna start an affinity group for LGBTQ plus identifying people. And we wanna start an affinity group for AAPI identifying people. They started and created that. So I think that is a way within, you know, if you don't have any experiences get in DEI that you can potentially initiate and lead and get some experience within your current role, even if it's not within the DEI role. Thank you, that, that helps a lot, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Lorenzo. And for everyone who's asked a question so far, um, again, feel please feel free to use the raise hand function or type your question in the chat, let's see. Um, or just feel free to unmute. Let's see. 
Yes, as Sarah just wrote, DEI is a very new field. Believe it or not, people with a diverse resume are DEI. The fact that, that those individuals have worked in various spaces, they have a diverse experience and you can really bring what they observe to, to light and make change. That's a really good point, Esther. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Maria, what are some um, like resources or anything that interesting that you've read lately within the field? You know, as we know, it's sort of kind of always changing, you know, even with like the news today, it probably has changed. What are some resources that, you know, one that stand out to you that, um, you know, stand out to you and two things that are um, resources that help you keep yourself updated? Yeah, well, I actually just finished. I took a data analytics to inform your DEI class at NYU and I just finished it last night and oh I read so many incredibly useful things through that course um, it's through the school of continuing Pro professional studies if anyone's interested highly recommend um, but uh, I, I read actually and what I found most useful in addition to the many articles were reading other companies DEI reports um, and looking at what they produce how they measure again that the orientation of this class was metrics and analytics so you know certainly my interest was is and has been oriented towards that but if that's something you're not familiar with highly recommend as I mentioned too, people are often asking how do you measure how do you measure your impact. Um, so I think familiarizing oneself with how other companies are approaching that and how they present the data how they measure progress how they measure effectiveness could also give you some good ideas. Um, for, for, you know, how to potentially answer interview questions or just to familiarize yourself if you're already in the DEI space with other tactics other companies are taking. Um, I'm happy to, I would need a moment, but, or maybe afterwards, Sam, I could send you some links oh, yeah. and you could send it to attendees. I'm happy to share those examples that I've been reading through this week. Um, that's just something off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I read a lot of, honestly, I read a lot of fiction. I read a lot of, um, creative nonfiction as well. And I do find it enriches my DEI work because, um, you know, I, I think there's a certain creativity and um, innovation that's required to be successful in this field. You have to really be able to, I'm willing to think outside the box. So I think staying connected to that part of myself is something that I like to do in my free time. Um, and it like fuels my, my, my work professionally as well. Oh, that's great. I, I, I like what you said about, you know, like fiction, you know, I, I too, like I read a lot of historical fiction when I do, did read, I think COVID has kind of just like, I don't read as much anymore, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. There is like a level of creativity for, you know, historical fiction to have to put yourself in these situations and how do you take those characters beyond. Um, going back to the data analytics program, <laughs> there was a question that did come through on the RSVP form. Um, whether, you know, you've done it in the work or uh, at your work, or if, if it's something that you've just learned at NYU, um, have they discussed like how to balance the need of quantifiable goals and qualitative goals? And how did, how did those kind of come together? How do you make those goals in DEI? Oh, yes, 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 and yes. So it really depends on what you're trying to measure. So first and foremost, um, any company, in my opinion, to do in order to engage in successful DEI work, you need to know who, who your company is made of. And you'd be surprised, I mean, I've been surprised by how many companies don't collect detailed demographic data. Um, they just collect racial and gender data because that's what the EEOC requires. Um, but to really have a more comprehensive understanding of who your people are you're trying to serve, in your DEI role, you need to know who your people are. So for me, a primary um, point of focus that I've been really passionate about as it relates to data is expanding the type of data we collect. So we don't just collect racial and gender data. We also collect gender identity. We also collect LGBTQ status. We also collect disability status. And we also collect veteran status. Um, we've also added Middle Eastern North African as a racial ethnic category for people to choose, um, even though it's not officially recognized by the EEOC, because we recognize that the EEOC might be a little behind where we want to be and the, 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 um, the steps we want to take. Um, so anyway, first and foremost, expanding the type of data you collect is critical. Then it's about like, well, what in the data do we want to look at? What metrics do we want to measure? So do we want to look at retention? Um, do we want to look at turnover? 
Um, yes, and I see someone in the chat just wrote so many people who identify as North African Middle Eastern do not want to identify as white. That's correct. And that's why we at our firm have created it as a new category for people to select. Um, you know, I was saying retention, also hiring practices. Um, my firm is a part of what's called a Mansfield rule certification, which ensures that at least 30% of all um, applicants for leadership opportunities at our firm, like client pitches, you know, leadership or governance roles, et cetera, are women, people of color, LGBTQ, or someone with a disability. And that's a way to also, you know, measure um, potentially, you know, your certain hiring standards or promotion standards as well, because client pitches inform promotion. Um, so, you know, I think it really depends on what the goal is that you're trying to measure, uh, what type of data you look at. Our engagement survey, as I mentioned before, that's that's rich data for us because in addition to the detailed demographic data, we're collecting engagement data. Um, that gives us information about, you know, if retention issues potentially, if people are interested in leaving and why they're interested in leaving or what's effective, what's working well. Are there particular groups of people who feel a sense of belonging at the firm and others who do not? Um, so that's another data point that we focused on as well. So. There's a lot to look at and uncover as it relates to DEI metrics. Yeah, that's all very interesting. Um, I love that. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, Anna had just asked, can you share information on the NYU course that you've just finished? You bet. Um, it's, well, maybe I'll find the title or uh, Sam, would it be better to send it to you for oh, you yeah. to include in the follow-up email? Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Anna, your hands up, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to just ask if it's through Metro Center or if it's through like a different, was it through NYU or was it through the NYU School of Ed one that they do the DEI trainings? Is it? It was through the NYU School of Continuing Professional Studies. Oh, okay. And yeah. It was virtual. So I didn't have that, to. But it was a, a course. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it was a course. It was graded, but it was, it was also short. It was only four classes, four evenings, but I learned so much yeah. in those four yeah. classes. I highly recommend. I haven't taken any other classes there, but I know some of my classmates were participating in a certificate program. Yeah. So, you know, for some of you here who want to transition, that might be something worth looking into. Although I, I don't, I don't think you need it to be honest, but if you wanted that, it, they exist. Um, I mean, that, I can't, you know, I'll just, sorry to cut you off, but um, I wanted to ask actually a, a separate question, but on this uh, just related to this, I think that, so I'm not an alum, I'm a professor actually, I just wanted to say, you know, <laughs> or just because I'm interested in the topic and I was excited to to hear your thoughts on this area. Um, and so I think I think you're right, right? That like, it depends on how you market yourself. And it seems like now everyone, their mother is getting a certificate and stuff, but like, you know, really, you know, it's not always necessary for some areas. I think that the knowledge is necessary and anyway, but um, but here's my question. Um, so uh, with the the new since since George Floyd's murder last summer with a new kind of all these um the uh, pushback on like what are performative things and what are not performative right uh, and so what I'm kind of curious about uh, and I'm thinking of course in the context of CUNY Baruch School of Public and International Affairs but also I mean in 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 your um, organization uh, you I guess you just gave an example and you've given a couple of examples of where there are non performative activities right because like your example just now of the thirty percent. I guess quota. I don't know what you want to call that, right? Yeah. Packages, right? I mean that that is interesting. Um, I'm just wondering, kind of what even the box that you described, like having a different checkbox, right, in terms of sense of belonging and stuff. So, I, so I guess you've already answered a couple, and I'm just wondering what you think about, um, you know, non performative and yeah. non-expensive stuff yeah. because right yeah. because what it is is like we don't have a lot of research you know cuny okay yeah so, i do like, i used to work at cuny by right the way. so tell me <laughs> what you think if you have these like miracle examples where it, <laughs> yeah it, I, I think of them as changes in culture a lot but yeah, yeah. it depends on leadership but then you got to hire the right leaders and so so i'm just wondering your thoughts on that that's a great question so Two things come to mind that are free or almost free, um, and in my opinion, not performative at all because they serve the people you're trying to impact, mentorship programs and affinity groups. So both of those programs are meant to serve, you know, underrepresented members of the community, right? So the individual themselves. So it might, you know, if we're trying to distinguish, I think it's hard to, to make that clear cut distinction between performative and non-performative, because I think there's, it gets blurry, but if we're, that's how I would measure that distinction, right? Like what's actually serving an individual directly. And I see those two programs as being something that can either be 100% free or very low cost to offer. 
employees or students or whatever the community is you're trying to serve. Um, mentorship programs, we have tons of mentorship programs, uh, DEI mentorship programs that are that my department's responsible for managing, and they're so impactful. Um, they're, they have such a huge impact on people's professional development and growth at our firm. They have a huge impact on people's retention at our firm. So like we see the connections to participation in, in our programs and these DEI outcomes that, and goals that we have. Um, and mentorship programs are literally free. They don't cost anything. Well, <laughs> so I, I would say I fully disagree that as an economist because they cost people's time. Oh, time. And, and I was going to say, well, and they, that your department does it right but we don't have right like, we don't have so so but but no but you're right i don't want to like squash no that. it's a good it, point it, you're talking about additional resources which we don't have in cuny but i yeah. do think, like the big problem in in cuny or i'll speak for baruch is that like we just don't have that many resources and so we don't have people who like will set up the mentorship or and do all that you know yeah oh, i hear what you're I, saying i hear what you're saying it's i mean the the thing is that i i appreciate what you're sharing because in terms of retention like i think of the retention of black students you know i think of i'm thinking cuny right now you know right. um, and uh and so i'm just kind of curious I, I appreciate how you say that there's evidence on stuff like mentoring and affinity groups, because that's really important because you're right. We're not hiring a new person. What we should do is embed this into job titles, you know, yeah. uh, that's what I think has to be done, which is like slowly over time. And that is actually so helpful that we're having this conversation because I think what I'm recognizing is that if we don't make this part of people's jobs, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, these are not one-offs, right? We have like one training here, one training there, that stuff. There's research on like, oh, that's not great. Um, but what I'm wondering is, I, I love the examples you gave about the quotas and those things. And I love that you're just emphasizing the importance of relationship building and having people feel a sense of belonging. And yeah. so I do think that that is something that CUNY can do. It's not a high expensive thing, but it is taking a little bit of time from people like Samantha and people like, yeah. right, like it's, it's recognizing that DEI should be infused across everyone, yes. you know, but not being like, here's Sam, here's Sam, do it on top of everything. Right? Yes. That's and I really appreciate your point that you just raised too, because it reminds me of something I haven't shared that I think is important, which is our firm implemented earlier this year, a DEI billable credit policy for our attorneys. Um, so, and we have an unlimited hours cap for that. So I, you know, I'm, as I mentioned, as you all know, cause you all know my career trajectory now, I'm new to the legal industry. So when you hear that phrase, time is money for lawyers, it's actually true. Um, time is money. And at my firm, you know, uh, attorneys who participate in these mentorship programs, I say it's free. You're right. It's not free <laughs> at all, but um, attorneys who bill or who are participating in these mentorship programs and in leadership roles and affinity groups can bill their time. And we do not have an unlimited, and we do not have a cap on that, right? So people can do that unlimited throughout the year. We have a same and similar policy for our uh, pro bono work as well. I know, it, I see your comments. I agree, uh, very progressive. And this is why I love working where I work. Um, yes, putting money where the mouth is, 100%. But, um, I was going to say something else. I lost my train of thought. Uh, all this to say is, um, oh, I remember what I wanted to say. Uh, you know, sometimes that when you embed DEI into people's roles where it's not their primary function, the outcome is people feel tokenized because the people who are drawn to doing that work is people are people who are, care about it because they share those identities or hold those identities, and so then the outcome isn't what we're we're trying to reach, right? Or, you know, people end up their, their, their job performance and their role that they actually have um, suffers as a result. And then they have more negative performance evaluations, which impacts their progression, which of course we also don't want. So I think it's about, you know, I think to, in order for DEI work to be sustainable, you need full-time roles, um, uh, multiple full-time roles, um, you know, being responsible for the successful implementation. Otherwise, it's not really fair and it can be burdensome to the people who, who you're integrating the responsibilities into because it is a lot of work. This is more than a full-time role for me, 100%. Um, so anyway. Thank you so much. Um, no, I really appreciate um, you know, hearing all that, especially about the billable hours like that. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed by that. Like that is definitely something that um, you know, you don't hear about a lot in really any workplace, whether it's private, public, government, nonprofit, and, you know, just to hear that it is possible. Kind of going back to your 
point about, you know, fiction, you have to be creative. I feel like you have to have a level of creativity to even, you know, think about that. Um, so that I really appreciate that. So um, Esther, I think you're going to have the last question of the day. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, Esther Moss here, MPA alum from 2020, our, our hardest year. <laughs> Um, so I have a question. So how do you foresee keeping the subject of DEI relevant? Um, we hear a lot about many organizations forming DEI task force and now creating roles, particularly when there is a national event such as a civil rights violation. And of course, 2020, you know, with the pandemic and then, you know, all the civil rights violations and everything. That was a huge example. But once the hype dies down, there seems to be a discomfort with and even a detachment with the subject. You know, um, so forums such as this are, are there's there's low to no attendance. You know, so how do we keep this topic, you know, sexy enough to, you know, be at the front of of our conversations? That's a great question, and I think that's a question I I think about daily, and I don't necessarily have an answer to, but what I will say is. For me, it's about demonstrating the outcomes that your you know, DEI work has been responsible for or a part of and, and making sure you do a good job marketing and communicating it. Um, so a lot of DEI work in an organization happens behind the scenes. Um, a lot of the changes that my team has been a part of have been 100% behind the scenes, even changing the parental leave policy, you know, like, so I think it's really important when you do have wins, when you do have success with your DEI efforts, when you form new affinity groups or whatever the work is that you're doing, it's important to make sure that everyone knows about it. So we send firm-wide recaps, emails. We Communications is a big part of DEI work. And I think um, we, have to, we have to stay you know, accountable to ourselves. Um, and to our goals, we have to stay well organized also because DEI work tends to have a bit of a magnifying glass to it and not everyone wants DEI work to be successful. So um, we have to stay on our toes and we have to support each other. And um, we have to, I meet with my colleagues in other industries all the time about like learning and exploring best practices, talking through challenges. So I think building a community of DEI professionals and staying connected to that community is something to one can do as well. Um, but I really think how you communicate the message of your impact matters, which is why I think measuring impact matters a lot in sustaining DEI work and making sure leadership knows why it's important and valuable and worth their time and money. Great, thank you so much. All right, Teresa, sorry, you actually have, you have uh, the floor now. Thanks so much. Um, hi everyone. And um, thank you, Maria, for um, presenting today. Really appreciate it. Um, I heard about uh, your talk today through Jelani, who I believe is a mentee oh, yeah. yours. Um, and so I'm a student at uh, the Baruch um, Industrial Organizational Psychology Program, a master's student there. And my question sort of relates to what Esther was talking about and a lot of the things that have been said. So uh, the company that I currently work for, um, they had, um, after the George Floyd murder, they had, uh, issue, they had issued a survey um, for the entire company to sort of get a sense of what things pertaining to diversity and inclusion um, that they need to work on and like what things they're doing well. And, and so I was a part of that group that analyzed the data and presented the findings. Um, however, it's been about a year and nothing has been done. So my interpretation is that it was just like a box to check off. And so mm. my question is, how do you, and this is obviously something that I'm really passionate about and I'm looking for roles um, in DEI as like a coordinator or manager, but because nothing was done, I feel like I don't have sort of um, like, anything to like so, sort of show for because I was a part of this and so so I'm wondering how do you get leadership buy-in when there's no really sense of like psychological safety or belongingness in a company so I think that will vary depending on the the circumstance of a work environment um, and the motivations that those particular leaders might have so um, as I mentioned earlier um, with John I think you know is it are they looking for business? Do they need a business incentive for why they need to support DEI? Do they need if, you know, do they need, it sounds like they don't need an employee engagement incentive to understand why DEI matters. Um, so identifying, you know, or, or testing out if you're not able to identify different tactics for getting their buy-in 
um, is, is a strategy you can do. But I also think, and this is a reality, unfortunately, it's a hard truth, a lot of places don't want their DEI initiatives to be successful. And mm -hmm. they are just vanity metrics, you know, they're, it's or vanity efforts or performative efforts to check a box. And I think that's sometimes information for us to take and consider. And I think the reality is, um, some places are just wanting to check check a box. I'm grateful that's not the circumstance I'm in, but I've heard of many colleagues who have been in that circumstance. And um, you can't necessarily convince people of your humanity or the humanity of your colleagues or the, the needs of your colleagues um, if they're not willing to see it. And you can certainly try different tactics, like I mentioned, um, data, surveys, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Industry standards is something I haven't mentioned, but that we rely on too. We look at what's happening in similar organizations um, or, or institutions, and, and we look at how our data compares to them to justify um, the need. I'm not sure if you've tried that tactic already. Um, so uh, that's a potential strategy. And um, I will share too, for everyone who's still on the call, feel free to reach out to me at any time. I love supporting CUNY and CUNY students. And um, I'm happy to be a resource for you if I wasn't able to like fully address the question you had today, or if you have a follow-up question after, you can always reach out to me on LinkedIn. I know um, Sam shared my LinkedIn profile. Feel free to shoot me a message there. And I'll also drop my email in the chat. So I really do welcome anyone to reach out at any time. I'm happy to stay connected and talk further. Yes, thank you so much, Maria. This has been so helpful. We really enjoyed um, everything you've had to share. My final question that I always like to ask our alumni um, are: is what's something in your field that you're looking forward to, whether it's in your actual work, whether it's something in the field? What are you looking forward to in, in, uh, in DEI? Um, for me, I'm so proud of all of th that our department's been able to accomplish in this one past year alone, and I want to keep pushing the envelope <laughs> further and further. So the parental leave policy like was very meaningful to me for, for the ability to change. That's changing people's lives, hundreds of people's lives, if they choose to have a child or their partner chooses to have a child. So I wanna keep looking for and identifying opportunities like that, that are gonna have a significant impact on people's livelihoods and well being. And I wanna keep doing, pushing myself to do better and be better and think more outside the box than I already do in, in the interventions we establish because this is something I'm very, I truly care about. So that's all I hope for myself. <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing, Maria. Everyone, please join me in thanking her for, uh, for <laughs> joining us today. Um, and this was our final Marks Alumni Career Chat for this semester. Thank you all for joining us. Please, please take care of yourselves as we approach final season. I'm wishing the best for all of you. Um, and everyone, please have a great rest of your week. Or have a great weekend. It's Friday. <laughs> yeah. Bye, everyone. So nice to meet Thank you, you all. Yeah, Thank you so much. Me. Goodbye, Thank everyone. You. Thank you for doing this. Thank you.